Have you ever wondered more about the countries that lived around Israel and the Bible, Old Testament and New? That's what we'll talk about today. The Bible tells us to love our neighbors and also love our enemies, probably because generally they are the same people. G.K. Chesterton. Today we're going to talk about the other countries that lived around the areas of the Old and New Testament. We're not going to do a deep dive and a lot of history, but just so that you know a little bit more about them. It always interested me. My pastor always gave a good explanation of what these other countries were like and where places were. And I could also tell that some people just weren't interested in it and their eyes rolled back into their heads. But I found it particularly intriguing because, first of all, those nations exist today, just with different names, but they played an important role in the history of the Old and New Testament. But also, they add a contrast to what nations should and should not be. So this is just going to be a short introduction to those other countries, give some general characteristics about them just so you know a little bit when they talk about Babylon. What does that exactly mean? So our story starts out with Abraham, who moved into the Oak of Morah, which is located near Shechem, which is in Israel, which is about 35 miles northeast of Bethlehem. And that's where the whole story and the land starts taking place. And Abraham was from a place called Ur, or Ur of the Chaldeans, And that is in modern-day Iraq. And we can go all the way back. The Hittites were the sons of Heth. The Canaanites, the sons of Cain. The Elamites, the son of Shem. You can start going back with all these various cultures that existed and relate them back to biblical people at the very beginnings of Genesis. We'll talk more about these different countries and the roles that they play. But one thing that you'll notice once we talk about all the other countries is that they rose and fell frequently. The reason we don't know them by their name is because they got sacked and taken over and taken over and changed by names. And so nations are very unstable. And if you ask the Babylonians or if you ask the Persian nations if they would be around forever, they would, of course, believe the answer is yes. Nations always think that they will live or go on forever. So when Abraham gets to the promised land, he marries, of course, Sarah. He also has his concubine, Hagar. They have Isaac and Ishmael. So Isaac marries Rebecca. They have Jacob. Jacob also then has children through Leah, Zilpah, Bilhah, and Rachel. And Joseph is the firstborn son But those children of Jacob become the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. They are given lands. They become either the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was exposed to enemies all the time. The southern kingdom was a little bit protected because it had a giant desert that gave them a little bit of shelter from that. But the two nations fought all the time. We also read that Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. Because of his wisdom and his listening to God, he was able to prevent the Egyptians from succumbing to a giant famine. They were able to store the necessary grain to get away from the famine. And because they had enough, they were also able to protect Joseph's family, his brothers, to come and live along with Jacob while they waited out the famine. So that brings us to our very first nation that we'll talk about, and that is Egypt. Egypt, ancient Egypt, was a very proud country. They played board games. They had many gods, and the gods represented all sorts of different things, like when it came to the sun or the Nile or the ground. When we see the Bible talk about Egypt, we see that in the book of Genesis, the Israelis or the Hebrew people went into the land of Goshen because of the famine, and because Joseph was able to protect him. That was in Exodus 1.8. But then, when the Pharaoh died, it said there was a new Pharaoh who knew not Joseph. He didn't know Joseph, he didn't care about Joseph, and he didn't care about the things Joseph advised him to do. So things, I think, turned south from there. If you talk about Exodus, we're looking at something that is very hard to pin down, but they try to 
pin it somewhere in the 12th century BC at the times of Ramses III. And there's all sorts of archaeological evidences here and there. We're not an archaeology podcast, so I'm not going to go into a deep dive of it. But at that point, that is when Moses, Aaron, and his sister leave Egypt in the Exodus and go back to the land of Israel. But the thing to know about Egypt is that they were a huge military power. They conquered so many pieces of land. They conquered the Canaanites. They conquered eventually the Assyrians. We'll talk about the Assyrians coming up next. But they were a military power all by themselves. What's interesting about Egypt in general is that they did write down things in hieroglyphics. They kept records. And so there's records. And so people often say, well, you know, Egypt never really mentions Israel. There is a steel that is mentioned Israel, and it's called the Merneptah steel or the Israeli steel, or maybe it's stele, but it, it mentions Israel by name. And this is the line that it mentions when it mentions Israel. It says, the Canaanites have been plundered in every sort of woe. Ashkelon has been overcome. That's where I was on my archaeological dig. Gezer has been captured. Yah Omen is non-existent, and Israel is laid waste, and his seed is not. So it does mention Israel, and it mentions a people called the Shatsu people. The Shatsu people believed in Yahweh. Israel, Hebrews, believed in Yahweh too. And that they also fled into the water, into the Nile, to escape. So there is some mention of people from this land that did escape from them. It is so highly debated. Like I said, this is not an archaeology podcast, but there is some reason to believe that these are the people. The other interesting thing is that Hebrew people ended up bringing back language artifacts, bringing back certain aspects of the Egyptian people. And so while the Egyptians weren't all that impressed with the Israeli nation or the Hebrew nation, The Hebrews were pretty impressed with the Egyptians, and they brought back certain words. They brought back certain phrases. They have names that are Egyptian names, not Hebrew names. So there is evidence beyond just written evidence that the Israelis were in Egypt and were there long enough to take on some cultural aspects of it. There's also an interesting part about where there are um, houses in Luxor that are structured like Israeli houses that are built in the same kind of matter. And the foodstuffs that were there were also in the same foodstuffs of the people who were people from the land of Israel. And what's interesting is if you listen to a little bit of discussion about it, I did a lot of research into this, is that a lot of times the Shatsu people are referred to as the Edomites or pasture people in the land of Canaan. And I have to think about it in this sort of sense. When I went to Israel, I would say, oh, well, I'm from Wisconsin. Oh, you don't know where Wisconsin is? Well, Wisconsin, and by the time I just eventually gave up and just said, I'm from Chicago. Oh, Chicago. So I became Jill from Chicago. Now, if you know much about me, I don't really like that very much because I think of myself as a Northwoods girl and not someone from Chicago. But in a sense, nobody knew what I was talking about if I said anything but Chicago. And you can kind of see that the Egyptians, if they didn't think very highly of Israel or the Hebrew nation or the people living there, if you just gave them some sort of a general term like shatsu, which can mean plunderer, means people who were just, I think, agitating them on the border, then you could see where that it wouldn't be exact name, primarily because they didn't care enough to know any of the names of any of the Hebrew people. To them, Canaanites, Elamites, Edomites, Israelis, all the same people anyway. They, it doesn't even really matter which side you're on. It's just like if you tell someone from Israel, you're from Wisconsin, Upper Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, you're all going to end up eventually just saying, I'm from Chicago. So essentially, they say that basically from the mid-1500 BC to about the mid-1100 BC, Egypt had a lot of control and a lot of pressure on Israel. The area, it set up camps over there, fought the Assyrians, it fought the Hittites on Israeli land. So it's not that unknown that Egypt and Israel were frequently crisscrossing towards each other. 
the, the Hebrew people walked out of Egypt with an understanding, with the language of the Egyptian people. The next are the Assyrians or the Syriac people, not the same thing as Syrians, Assyria. And Assyria right now is in the Mesopotamian area. It made up of people who were Akkadians or Sumers, and it was a civilization that was very, very old. Assyria became a nation in about 2600 BC, and sometimes they also identified as Chaldeans, Aramians, or Syriacs, and right now, Assyrians are primarily Christian, and what you see is the remnants in Iraq and Turkey and Iran of people who are Christians are the descendants of the Assyrian people. So I spent two summers in Israel. One summer was an archaeological dig in a place called Ashkelon. And Ashkelon, I think, was sacked by the Assyrians. And we got t-shirts that showed basically the Assyrians sacking (laughs) Ashkelon as a part of it. But you can see, again, this is from the north area. So when we look at the two areas of Israel, the northern tribe and the southern tribes, the northern tribe was called Israel and Judah was called the southern tribes. The northern area of Israel was Samaria, Beit El, Jericho, Shechem, Jaffa, if you've ever been to Israel. And then in the southern part of Judah, that would be considered Beersheba, Hebron, Jerusalem. Those were the southern parts. But because they had this constant attack from the Assyrians that were, was way north of them, the tribes that were up north, and these are all the children of Jacob, But the lands that they were given and then their ancestors after that were in the northern area, Samaria, or the southern area, Judah. So the Assyrians found it easy because they're from the north to attack the northern kingdom or Samaria because it was the closest to them. And so then what happened was is that the Assyrians took people from various other lands like Babylon and brought them into Samaria. So they hauled the people living in Samaria out. Then they brought other people in. And so if you wonder at the time of Jesus why people looked on Samarians pretty poorly, and in fact, you'll see at some point, Samarians in the New Testament were talked about very harshly. And if you think of the Good Samaritan, it was an embarrassment to the people who were priests and people who could help the person who got beat up on the side of the road. But who helped them? The Samaritan the good Samaritan. And that's why you think about it. They're like, well, there's nothing good in Samaria. Oh, but there there is that one good Samaritan. And that's because primarily the people that were now living in after the time of Assyria in northern Israel were descendants of other nations that got hauled in because they were also sacked by the Assyrians and just said, now you're going to go live over here. And then you start even seeing the Bible talk about Samaria and her idols in Isaiah, in Hosea, Or they talk about Jezebel and her idols. She was a Baal worshiper. But why was she a Baal worshiper? Because she wasn't a true Hebrew or Israelite. So northern Israel became known as a place that worshipped other gods, rain gods, fertility gods, Baal. And it primarily came from these other locations. And you can see that even culminate in 1 Kings 18, where Elijah comes up against the priests of Jezebel, who are all Baal worshippers. Then in 701 BC, the Assyrians sieged Jerusalem and attacked it. And at that time, you had Hezekiah as the king in Jerusalem. And that's where I talked about in previous episodes. When I went to Israel, we went into the tunnel of Hezekiah because he built a water aqueduct so that they could get fresh water into the city without having to go out because the Assyrians were sieging, parked outside, and waiting for the people inside Jerusalem to come out for something. But because they could be self-sufficient inside the city of Jerusalem, then they were able to do that. And this tunnel of Hezekiah is also sometimes known as the Salome Tunnel. It's right by the Pool of Salome. And it was built by Hezekiah to bring the water in. Army in 720 captured Samaria, the northern kingdom, and went on to try to move into Judah. Again, that's where Jerusalem was. Eventually, Judah became a vassal state of Assyria. So that means it paid tribute, annual taxes, (laughs) did what it said to these nations. But when Hezekiah became king of Judah, 
he decided that he was going to initiate a re-worship into God of the, of the Hebrew people and break the idols. He recaptured the land in the Negev Desert, including Ashkelon, where I was at, parts of Egypt, and took a stand against the Assyrians. He wasn't going to pay tribute to them anymore. But Sennacherib attacked Judah and laid siege to Jerusalem itself. Eventually, the Assyrian army was probably ended by the Egyptians. Others say that it was ended by plague, but it probably was a little of both, right? When in history do you have one and not the other? Usually plague and war kind of go together. But one way or the other, the Assyrian nation, empire, came to an end. And you can see a lot about this in Kings, Chronicles, Isaiah talks about this occupation of the Assyrians. Another impactful part of this is Aramea was sacked by the Assyrians as well. And they gained a language from the Phoenicians, who were sea people, big traders. They would go to various nations, but they talked Phoenician. The Aramaeans created their own language, which was Aramaean. And while Aramaic language became the mainstay in those lands. So that is where the Aramaean language really spread. Jesus and all the disciples, they spoke Aramaic. They could potentially speak Greek. They could speak Hebrew because that was the religion of their faith. They maybe even could speak um, Latin for the Romans, but Aramaic was their everyday conversation. And it became their mainstay language from 8th century BC when the Assyrians sacked the land of Israel. And it wasn't until Rabbi Bar Kokhba, who restored Hebrew as the official language in 132 AD. So from about 3500 BC all the way up to 132 AD, Aramaic was the language of Israel. So just to give you some time frame, the Code of Hammurabi was done in like 1792 BC in Babylon, and the Hittites sacked Babylon in 1595. The first Passover was somewhere around 1446 B.C. Again, not an archaeology podcast, but then King Tut was at 1360 B.C. They think that the Exodus was somewhere around 1290, and the story of Ruth was a little bit before that. Pharaoh Murnatep, who I talked about the steel, he was in that time frame. As we mentioned, the northern kingdom of Israel fell in 727 B.C., about and that leads up to the time that we're at right now. And just to give you some cross-cultural timing, the first Olympic game was in 776 BC, and supposedly Rome was founded in 753 BC. So you can see the new kingdoms are starting to gel. This brings us to Babylon. There was a pre-Babylonian nation, got sacked by the Assyrians, but Nebuchadnezzar II, who's the one that we know of in the Bible, he came about in 604 BC-ish. And that's just after the time when the capital of the Assyrians, Nineveh, fell to the Babylonians and Medes. Think about the Medes, they think, as modern Kurds. That's who the Kurdish people were. So think about it this way. So Abraham was the great and seven greats grandson of Noah. That is what William, the Prince of England, is a to George III, who started the war, the Revolutionary War with the United States. Or Victoria was to Mary, Queen of Scots, who went up against Queen Elizabeth. That's how many generations we had between them. So we're going to leave it there. That's the first part of this series, talking a little bit about these other nations. And then we'll talk about more nations coming up on next week's podcast. So my challenge to you is to think about the language of the Bible. How many different languages do we see? And what type of effect do you think it means when you have someplace that is speaking Aramaic, worshiping in Hebrew, have empires, either Greek or Roman, that are in your way speaking other languages too? And give the languages of the Bible a little bit of thought. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoy it. I wanted to give, like I said, just a little taste of this. And we'll talk more next week. And just remember, the steps to bridging gaps between people of different languages starts with small steps. Small steps.